So um, we're going to talk about physics first. Big question across the country. And one of the questions people have is, is it real physics? And that's what I want to talk about today. Not a specific curriculum, not just a, can we do it? Can we really teach physics first? <coughs> then there's physics for all. Here's how I like to think about science for all, physics for all. It's the same all as in freedom for all. Now, what does freedom for all mean in America? Well, the history of the United States is really the history of defining what we mean by all. When we started out this great nation, all meant white male landowners. That was a good definition. Then 35 years later, we said, sheesh, OK, all men. Even the African, even the, the, the blacks, the, the Negro slaves, yeah, OK, all, that's freedom for all. Then another 50 years later, somebody said, okay, the women. The women can be included also in war. We can let them vote. No, 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 only 100 years ago. And now we have the front page of the newspapers today, people trying to define what does it mean all. What about those immigrants who have been here for 23 years but aren't citizens? Is that included in all? The history of America is what do we mean when we say all? And whatever you think of when we say freedom for all, that's the all I mean when I say physics for all. Equal access provides equal opportunities. You don't have it otherwise. If you tell kids they can't take physics, then they don't have equal access to the course, and they are not going to have the opportunity to excel during their lives. We have huge achievement gaps if we look at those disaggregated subgroups in America. And part of that comes from access, part of that comes from opportunity, and part of it comes from a host of all sorts of things we're trying to work out. So that's what I mean by all. Pretty simple. All. What do I mean by physics? Because that's the other part. Right? Well, there's physics defined in the National Science Education Standards and all the state frameworks. There's AAAS benchmarks. There's all your core curriculums from your different states. Then we can have more general principles about the use of analysis and graphs and numbers to describe phenomenon. Or we can say that um, it's the use of experimental observation, logic, laws, and theories. This is physics. And then we hear, oh, no, what you want to do in ninth grade is real physics. I say, well, why isn't it real physics? And they say, well, there are no vector cross products. Real physics has vector cross products. However, if that's the way we're going to look at it. Let me tell you the trouble we get into. There is no high school course which is real physics. Everybody in college looks at whatever you do in high school and says, that's not real physics. In college, we do group theory, calculus of variations, not the regular calculus, calculus of variations. That's real physics. In graduate school, they look at the undergraduate and they say, that's not real physics. And you have to do group theory. And the PhDs who are running around, real physicists, they look at the graduate students and say, that's not real physics. Why do we think we're playing this game? Let me show you how ridiculous the game would look in something else. Let's outlaw Little League Baseball. <laughs> Why? Because we want kids to play real baseball. And real baseball, the ball comes in at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> and so I don't know why we're giving those bats and balls to those kids, because it's not real baseball outlawed. Or, why are those kids playing the cello at 11 years old? Yo-Yo Ma plays the cello. Rostropovich plays the cello. Pablo Casals plays the cello. This 11-year-old, I don't know what he's scratching between his legs, but it's not a cello. <laughs> so we don't do that with the, with the instrument lessons. We don't do that with the sports lessons. But if, oh, no, it's not real physics. We shouldn't let kids do the physics. So I guess you can see I'm pretty passionate about this <laughs> idea of <laughs> physics first. Think about your, your biology book. Chapter two of every biology book now has organic molecules. How are the kids understanding that if they haven't had chemistry? What are they even thinking when they see it? Let's take a look at this. This is a, a New York State <laughs> Regents exam in biology. That's a Regents biology question. Which is an example of a carbohydrate, and it's like, what are those lines? Why are there two lines next to the oxygen? What's going on? They haven't studied any chemistry yet. There's a question on a bio exam. A molecule, they don't even know what the molecule is. They haven't studied biology. I, I'm sorry, they haven't studied chemistry. Let's take another question in the bio exam. pH 
Enzyme action versus pH. What's pH? Well, I don't know. I haven't taken chemistry yet. One day I'll take chemistry. I'll know what pH is, but I'll try to answer these questions anyway. <laughs> what is the optimum pH? Well, you can probably do that from understanding the graph. Let's look at this typical chemistry exam. Positive and negative charges deflected from their straight line paths. What's wrong with that? You have to know some physics to know this. Something deflected from straight line paths, there must be a force. That's physics. Deflected alpha particles. Po these are all physics terms on a chemistry exam, but they haven't had a physics. So please memorize and just give me the answers. Don't have understanding of this because, well, the chemistry people say, no, no, we reached that. It would go in a straight line. How long does it take? It takes us five minutes. Well, in physics, we take three weeks on that, on what a force is. And three weeks, three weeks, they don't know what a force is as well as we would like them to. In chemistry, they spend five minutes and say, that's good enough. Also on the chemistry exam, pressure versus temperature. What do they think temperature is if they haven't studied physics? What do they think intermolecular forces are if they haven't studied physics? So here's a lab. So what are we going to do in, um, in physics to promote physics for all? I have a lot of kids in my class, a lot of ninth graders, and they all have different skills and talents. But we all like to give them the pendulum lab. Don't look at that. You'll get hit. You'll, ooh, you believe in <laughs> physics first. <laughs> um, so. Um, so we all give this pendulum lab, and we have kids work on the pendulum lab. We try to do it with inquiry to engage more students, and then we try to differentiate it to include all students. So how do we do it? Well, without inquiry, what we do is we say, well, let me tell you about pendulum. The longer the string, the longer the longer pendulum has a long period of, and let's see. Very short, very long. Everybody see that? OK. Oh, by the way, the mass doesn't matter. I could attach uh, something to this, and then it's the same one. You know, doesn't matter. So I'd like you to complete the data chart and make a graph. So everybody now take it, and uh, you can find the length of your pendulum, measure the period, fill out the chart, make a graph, hand it in. That's what we do. That's a non-inquiry lab. Um, sometimes, to really make it non-inquiry, you say, oh, and use the following lengths, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. <laughs> Don't use 45. <laughs> so let's do it with some inquiry. So with some inquiry, every team gets a different length of cord with a different mass attached. And everybody measures the time. It goes back and forth 10 times, and they compare results. And people say, three seconds, eight seconds, seven. It's like, why aren't they all the same? It's like, well, they're not all the same pendulum. What do you mean? It's like, well, they have different masses, they have different um, lengths, they have different colors. We're pulling it back different angles. It's like, well, you know what? You take your pendulum, change any way you want, predict the time for a pendulum of a given length and some mass. So at the end of this class, I'm going to say my pendulum is 38 centimeters. Oh, it might be 40 centimeters, 40. I don't know what I'm going to say yet. I'm going to do that at the end. And I'm going to tell you what mass to put at the end. And you're going to tell me what the period of a pendulum is like. Ooh, this sounds like it could be fun. A little bit of a puzzle, a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of inquiry. Or we can do it a little differently. We can say, there's a book that came out a few years ago by David Sobel called The Story of Longitude. The thorniest scientific problem of the 18th century was how to determine longitude. Many thousands of lives had been lost at sea over the centuries due to inability to determine east-west position. Wow, thousands of people died because we didn't know where they were. Wow. This is the engrossing story of the clockmaker, John Longitude Harrison, who solved the problem that, get, prob that Newton and Galileo had failed to conquer. I know, I heard of Newton, I've heard of Galileo, never heard of Harrison. He solved the problem that Newton and Galileo couldn't solve? yet claimed only half the promised rich reward. I want to read this book. I want to find out how he did it. Well, it has to do with clocks. It has to do with time. So here's a pendulum clock. How do you think this works? Can you get a pendulum to swing at one second and win the big prize and save thousands of lives? How about a half a second? Here's some string and some masses. Good luck. A little more inquiry. A little more, why are we doing this? What's the purpose of it? Now, 
what do we expect of all of our students? Well, different kids have different reading abilities, different math abilities. So let's look at the differentiated instruction. Everybody in ninth grade can plot period versus length and interpolate. Now it takes some kids five minutes to do it, and it takes other kids two periods. But everybody can do it. Learning disabled kids can do it. You can help them. They can all do that. Some will use a computer to help them do it. But they can do this. Some students will understand that if you plot the period versus the square root of the length, then you can find the slope and calculate g. Another level of math sophistication on the pendulum. And then we have some students who this is just not enough for them. What do we do for those really, those kids who really like physics? And we do is we pose a more interesting problem. We have a leaky pendulum. It's 50 physics illustrations um, by a, a Mad Magazine cartoonist, Garbage Pail Kids, and he illustrated all these. So this was the leaky pendulum. Let me tell you about the problem, of course because it's Mad Max. When he started doing these, he said, I, I see you like to label everything. So I labeled it A, B, Y, H, 2, O, because it seems like in physics you like to label everything so you know what it is. Um, and then there are fun things like a little shark fin down there. But here's the, here's the problem. You have a pendulum, and now it's made of a cylinder, a string and a cylinder. And the cylinder is filled with water. And it's going back and forth. And now the water starts leaking out. I want to see, does the pendulum's period increase, takes more time, stay the same, or does it decrease, goes faster? And so you can do this very close to your chest and nobody will see, but I will see and I want to see. That. So what do you think? The period will, as the water goes out, the period will increase, stay the same, or decrease? Let's see some thumbs. You don't have, you know, just right in front of your chest. I don't I see that. I need thumbs. Everybody got to vote. <laughs> Wonderful. A lot of people think it's going to stay the same because mass doesn't matter. The color of the string doesn't matter. The mass doesn't matter. Ah, but when the water leaks out, what's happening to the effective length of the pendulum? Let's take a look. Here the pendulum goes from about here to here. But as the water leaks out, it goes down because the cent so the pendulum is actually getting the mass doesn't matter but the pendulum is now getting longer if the pendulum gets longer then the period increases and we think we solved it except there's a there are a couple of kids who are even a little better than that and you say but what if the cylinder itself has mass what happens then now the center of mass or effective length of the pendulum has to do with where the water is and what the ratio of the mass of the cylinder is to the water because now it'll go, it'll get longer and longer and longer until there's no, then it's going to start going up until it becomes the center of mass of the cylinder so it gets shorter again and will start speeding up again. And then of course you might be concerned about how fast the water drains to figure out the dependence of the period on the time and so we have a couple of graphs here. This is period versus time, and this is a massless container. The Quantoons is the illustrations, literary quotes, and then we do these physics problems and solutions, tough physics problems. And that's because it's really a smooth curve. I just don't know how to use PowerPoint. But, um, <laughs> but it's a smooth, if you squint a little bit, it's a smooth curve. So the massive container, there it is. It increases as the length is increasing, and then as the, as the it decreases. Pendulum lab for all students. Do I expect all students to do this? No. A few. Mm, yeah, some. How about just the length more? How about the period versus square length? More. How about just graphing it? Yes. How about just finding the dependence of the length on the thing and it doesn't depend on the mass? Everybody. Differentiated instruction, physics for all. 